Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We do receive the word. We know it's written in our heart and mind. We thank you for the revelation, but thank you for all that you're accomplishing this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Well, this is the time of year when we are celebrating what Jesus accomplished at the time of Pentecost as far as what he did from heaven when he received the Holy Spirit from the Father and sent it into the earth. And we're going to talk about what Pentecost has brought forth. It's the beginning of the church era and what he has accomplished for every single one of us. What he has brought forth that you and I can partake of and see God working mightily in our life. We've talked about the Feast of the Lord in the past, but first of all, you must know that there are seven feasts of the Lord. They're not Jewish feasts, they're God's feasts. And these particular feasts are pointing towards the work of Jesus Christ in accomplishing his work for man. We see that four of these have been already fulfilled on the exact day by Jesus. The first one was the Feast of Passover when Jesus became the Passover lamb that went to the cross and made sin on that particular day. And we see then that the unleavened bread was that feast was the bearing away, the taking away of the sin, which is exactly what Jesus did in three days and three nights in the heart of the earth when he went down to hell and bare away the sins as they had been laid upon him. And then we see first fruits as the, at the resurrection, Jesus went up and presented himself as the first fruit that is of the ones who now have been born from the dead. And now the church had come into being as far as the new, the ones who could be born again, Jesus of course being the first one. And that occurred on the morrow after the Sabbath, which was the Feast of First Fruits fulfillment on the exact day. Fifty days later, we come to the time of Pentecost, which is, this is the time of year of the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost is where there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in order to bring the birthday of the church. And that happened on the exact day. God does things on the exact day. And then we see that there's three more feasts which are going to be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus, which is the Feast of Trumpets, the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air, the Day of Atonement, which is the judgment upon the nations, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which will be the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Those are yet to be fulfilled, and they will be fulfilled at the exact time as Jesus does everything right on time. It's going to be at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, today we're going to talk about what Pentecost has produced at the beginning of the church era and what it means to you. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Remember, they had to wait for that particular day because that's the day the Holy Spirit was poured out. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. This is when they got born again, as they were immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and they got born again, received, uh, having received Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, knowing all about this, they got born again. And then we see there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it sat upon them. Here's where the Holy Spirit came, and it was received. The Holy Spirit came to dwell in them. And then we see that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. Now they had this prayer language in operation, and the Holy Spirit now began to manifest himself as the service of the Lord was going forth through the filling of the Spirit. And, of course, this got all their attention, and they preached the gospel to them, Peter did, and 3,000 got saved. And it began the beginning of the church era for those who are alive. Well, God wants us to understand that what this means to you and to me. We must understand, though, that when Jesus went back to heaven after he was finished the 40 days of of revealing himself to those that were uh, the apostles and the, the disciples. And then he went back there and he was inaugurated as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He was seated at the right hand of the Father. And he was now made the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, declared the Lord and the Christ. And it says in Acts 2.33, being, therefore being by the right hand of, of God exalted and having received of the Father, he got this from the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. He has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. And Peter proclaimed here in verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
He's been made Lord and Christ. He is now the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the head of the church, and the church age began. What did Jesus accomplish for us? Jesus accomplished the redemption. Man had to be redeemed because of sin. The wages of sin is death. Somebody had to pay the price so that man could be reconciled unto God. And man couldn't do it. Only God could do it. But God was in heaven, so what was the answer? God had to become a man, and that's Jesus. He was the Word who was made flesh. And he came and, of course, walked the walk that Adam had failed and went to the cross and accomplished the redemption. Ephesians 1, 7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You and I have been redeemed. That means we've been purchased. We now belong unto the Lord. We see a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, over in verse 19, where it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You've got to understand, you and I have been purchased. We're not our own any longer. We belong to Him. He says, You are bought with a price. What was that price? It was the ransom price, the redemptive price that He paid with His life. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We, you and I, have been purchased, and as a purchased possession now, we now can come into relationship with Him. Now, now that Jesus has accomplished this, how does this begin to affect us in our life? Well, God wants to bring salvation to every single person. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 4, it says, Who will have all men to be saved? and to come unto the knowledge, the exact, precise, correct knowledge of the truth. God wants every one of us to be saved. Every one of us are to come to the true knowledge of the truth. Jesus is now the one who's the mediator. There's one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is it? It's the man, Christ Jesus. He's still a man. He is a man who, was remember, God and man were united together, and he's still the man, Christ Jesus who now is also God, seated at the right hand of the Father, as God called him God when he put, set him at his right hand in Hebrews chapter 1. Now, we see that Jesus is the mediator, so what needs to happen for a person? Well, we see, first of all, the attitude that God has towards man. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit or to know this means that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God was in Christ. What was his purpose? To reconcile the world unto himself, not imputing or charging their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So what needs to be declared, preached, proclaimed? The fact that he's not imputing our trespasses unto us. He's not charging us for any of our sins whatsoever. Now he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so, what's going to be the answer? What do we need to do? It all involves Jesus. Because Jesus is the only hindrance to coming into relationship with a, a, a person to come into relationship with God the Father. They've got to receive, can't, they can't ignore Jesus. That if, if they stumble at that stumbling stone, that would be a hindrance for them coming in to relationship because he's the only way. He's the only way in John chapter 14 because Jesus is the one who is the redeemer of mankind. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can only do it through Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He is the only way. There is no other way. We see over in Acts chapter 4, it talks about how in verse 12, it says this, Neither is there salvation in any other, but there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We're going to be saved by receiving Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And when the gospel comes to us, it is the power of God that is going to produce the results in our life. In Romans chapter 1, over in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. The Word is the power of God. What will it produce? It will produce salvation to everyone who believes. Every single one can be born again. 
And what do we need to do? Well, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It goes on in verse 10, and he says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, you must believe with your heart, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We believe with our heart, and then we act upon the word, speaking forth, confessing with our mouth, that unto salvation as we receive him as our personal Lord and Savior. We see over in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, as many as received him, the word received is a Greek word lombano, which means to take hold of, take um, him as our Lord and Savior. To them gave he the power or the right to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Receiving Jesus, when you and I receive Jesus, we get a brand new spirit. We come into relationship with the Father. And this is the fulfillment of what Ezekiel prophesied. Ezekiel had prophesied what was going to come at the redemption of mankind uh, experientially in our life where we get born again. When he said in Ezekiel 36, 26, he said, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. You and I get a new heart, and we get a brand new spirit. When is that? That's the day that we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Jesus had spoken to this when he was here in John chapter 3. He spoke in verse 5. He said, Verily, verily, I, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Two births. There's a being born of water, there's being born of spirit. What's born of water? It's not water baptism, as people have erroneously thought. No. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's talking about physical birth. Because when you're born of water, you're wa the water sack is around you in your mother's womb, and when that breaks, then you're coming forth. It's talking about physical birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's talking about spiritual birth. There's a physical birth, and there's also a spiritual birth. And that's what all, all must experience. That's why I said, marvel not, I said unto you, you must, it is absolutely necessary that everybody be born again. This is what you're to share with other people. When you go to preach the gospel, share these scriptures and point out that they must be born again and they need to receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and they will get a brand new spirit and tell them that God is not imputing their sins against them. There's only one sin that they're convicted of as it says in John chapter 16, in verse 9. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, he's going to convict them of sin, singular, because they believe not on me. That's been the stumbling stone for the world out there. But if they will receive Jesus, they will come into relationship because they will get a brand new spirit. Now what happens when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior? We get a new spirit. What spirit is that? In Galatians chapter 4, we see in verse 6, it says, Because your sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What do we get? The Spirit of His Son, which is what? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. So now we have the Spirit of Jesus Christ that comes from Jesus. That's what's come on the inside of us. And now we have come into sonship. We are now in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. We see in Romans 8.15, You've not received the spirit of bondage again to fears, fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now God is our Heavenly Father. And now we see if we're children, and not only are we children, we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You've come into relationship with God the Father now. And what has happened? You have a new spirit, and it's brand new on the inside of you. We see in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're brand new on the inside of you, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Where? In spirit, not in your soul. You've got the same mind, will, and emotions, and you've obviously got the same body. What's new is what is new in spirit. You and I get a brand new spirit. All things are new in spirit. Now, once we have gotten born again, what else? that we see can happen to us. We need now to receive the Holy Spirit. And it's important that you understand that the new birth 
is scripturally called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is contrary to what is being taught in the entire full gospel, charismatic, uh, word of faith, uh, whatever you want to call the group, um, Pentecostal world out there. Because the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The baptism of the Holy Spirit brought us into the body of Christ. The body of Christ is what we come into when we're born again. Why is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit? We've well, got to understand what baptism means. Baptizo is an untranslated Greek word, uh, baptized, untranslated Greek word, baptizo. They just made an English word out of it, baptize. Doesn't tell you what it means. What's it mean? It means to immerse or submerge or engulf in something. What happens when we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior? You and I are immersed, submerged, and engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He takes the old spirit out, and a new spirit comes in, which is what? The spirit of Jesus Christ, because now we have the spirit of his son. So now we have the spirit of Christ in us. Well, then, how do we get the Holy Spirit in us? Because the Holy Spirit hasn't come into us yet. The Holy Spirit is received after that. As he goes on and says, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether it be bond or free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. See, the beginning of the church age, you must understand, we get born again, but many people out there in the Christian world, they get born again and then they stop there. They think they got the whole package. They've not understood that there is something that should happen immediately after that, which is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of Jesus Christ comes from Him who we received as our personal Lord and Savior, while the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. It says so over in John chapter 15, in verse 26, it says, When the comforters come, who I will send, Jesus doing the speaking, from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father. So where's the Holy Spirit come from? From the Father, not from Jesus. That's why Jesus received the promise of the Father before he sent it. He got it from the Father and sent it in. So we talk about the fact that first we get born again. Then we receive the Holy Spirit. That is shown in the latter part of this verse where it says, we've been all made to drink into one spirit. What is drinking synonymous with? Well, first of all, if I take a drink, something gets into me, doesn't it? I drink something, it's come into me. S drinking is synonymous with the receiving of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, verse 37, the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. What's he talking about when he says drink? This means something's going to come into me. He says so in verse 39. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him, that means believers who are born again, should receive, the Greek word lambano, take the Holy Spirit into them. Well, the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He wasn't given until after he was glorified. So this shows that the, the drinking in, which is the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us, is called the receiving of the Holy Spirit. This is important for you to understand, not only from a doctrinal standpoint, but also for an experiential standpoint, so you receive the Holy Spirit after you're born again, but also to be able to share it with others. You need to be able to teach the truth and help people get born again and then receive the Holy Spirit immediately when you have shared the gospel with them. Acts 8, 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. He preached Christ unto them. He preached about what Jesus accomplished and how they need to receive Jesus. Well, the people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake. They were hearing and seeing the miracles he did. So they, they received the word of God that came forth. In fact, even says in verse 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the name of Jesus. You call upon the name of Jesus and you're going to be saved. They were baptized, both men and women. So these people got born again and they were baptized, so they were saved. Did they have the Holy Spirit yet? No. Verse 14, when the apostles were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. This is a later time. What are Peter and John coming down to do? Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive, again, this word lambano, receive, take the Holy Spirit into them. Uh, why did that have to happen? 
It says, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. The Holy Spirit was not fallen upon any of them to come to be received yet. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they were born again and baptized, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. Then they laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is received subsequent to salvation, and that is important to understand. Same thing was addressed in Acts chapter 19 and verse 2. And pa Paul found some disciples at Ephesus, and he said to them, Have you received lambano, same Greek word, taken the Holy Ghost, since you believe? They already were believers. They didn't even know anything about it. That was their answer. They said to him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They knew nothing about it. Well, Paul ended up ministering to him. When he laid his hands upon him, the Holy Ghost came on him. They spake with tongues and prophesied. The Holy Spirit is received after we have been born again. As believers in Christ, we are to receive it. And you must understand it's one of the promises. It's important that you understand these scriptures, especially when you go to witness to people. You need to know that Acts 8, you need to know Acts 19, you also need to know this scripture, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. It says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Well, that meant they acted upon that word, they trusted, they received Jesus, they got born again. In whom also, after that you believed, this means following having believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That tells you the Holy Spirit was received after they believed, after they were born again. And notice what it calls the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. Well, who gets promises? The ones who are born again. So the promise is received by a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit of promise. It also tells you it's the earnest or the money like a down payment, the first payment, of our inheritance. Otherwise, we should be getting someone born again and then getting them to receive the Holy Spirit immediately, the first thing. When you lead someone to get born again, do not stop there. Get, take them right into receiving the Holy Spirit immediately so they have the Holy Spirit on the inside of them. It's the part of our inheritance. So it's a promise and it's part of our inheritance. And you can take them very simply through a prayer such as in Luke 11, verse 13. Luke 11, 13. The last part of the verse says, How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Notice who's, that someone is approaching God as his heavenly Father. It doesn't say God will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. It says your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. So who's doing the asking? It's the one who has a relationship to God as his heavenly Father. So that's a born-again believer. So the born-again believer is then to receive the Holy Spirit from the Father. And this is a promise. One of the reasons you know it's a promise as well, the Greek word ask is the word aiteo. Aiteo is a word which is a covenant word from the New Testament, which, let me show you what this means. I'm sorry, I messed that up. This is the Lightning Bible program, which has Strong's Concordance reproduced inside of it. This is a comparison of similar words, and the number that we just showed you for ask, Iteo's number 154, if you notice in the lower window where we have the Strong's number. Then when we look at this, we see that 154 means strictly a demand of something due. Why would we be making a demand of something due? Because that's a promise. It's part of our inheritance. The inheritance belongs to us, and a promise already belongs to us, and is simply making a spiritual legal demand according to covenant to receive something that's due us, which is the promises of God that have already been given to us. Therefore, again, this is talking about someone who's a believer making a legal demand of what's due them, the promise of God, part of their inheritance, for the Father to give them the Holy Spirit. And so we receive the Holy Spirit. What else happens to us? And that's what happened. You say, well, did that happen on the day of Pentecost? Sure did. Let's go back to that for a moment. When the day of Pentecost has fully come, what's the first thing that happened in verse 2? Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. If a, a rushing mighty wind came in and filled this place where we're all sitting, what would the effect of it be? We'd all be immersed, submerged, and engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit, right? That's what baptism means. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that what happened? They got born again at that point in time. 
than what happened after that. Then the, appeared cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. That's the Holy Spirit coming upon them to be received on the inside of them. That's where the Holy Spirit was received. And then, as we said, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues. Now you have a prayer language. You can pray in tongues as, uh, as now that you have the Holy Spirit within you. Now, we also need to understand, now that we've come into this relationship with God, what kind of a relationship do we have? It's important that you share the truth with people and you understand it, of course, yourself. You just didn't sign on the dotted line, get your ticket to heaven, and then go live your life and do whatever you want. No. You came into a covenant relationship with God. Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Jeremiah prophesied of this. He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. A new one. It's going to replace that old one. And he goes on and he's talking, it says, Not according to the covenant I made with the fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. He says, I'm going to, This covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I'm going to put my law on in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I'll be to. Uh, they're God and they shall be my people. A brand new covenant. Something different on the inside of them. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus mentioned about the fact that he was going to make a new covenant. And we see down in Hebrews, it's stating this, and right, remember he's writing to the Hebrew Christians. They had to understand this and get this straight. In Hebrews chapter 8, in verse 6, it says here, He's speaking of Jesus, how he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much he's the mediator of a better covenant. We've come into a better covenant, established upon better promises. We have better promises now. If the first covenant had been faultless, if there was no problem with it, then there should no place have been sought for the second. But there was a problem with it because it was not a perfect covenant. It was made between God and a man who would fail. And furthermore, it did not produce the new birth. The new covenant produces the new birth now because of Jesus, who is our Savior, and has accomplished the redemption. He goes on and says, here, defining fault with them, that you behold, the days come, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the same things we read in Jeremiah chapter 31. He quotes it exactly. And he says down here in 10 again, verse 10, that this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. In the New Testament, God takes his word, he writes it and puts it in your heart and in your mind. And that is so important. Now, the word of God is written in you, so now it can produce fruit, and it will bring forth promises in your life as you hear and you do it. Now, another thing we must understand, what else has happened? when the church age began. There was a fulfillment of a prophecy that was given back in Exodus. Exodus chapter 19, and back in verse 5. He said to all of Israel, If you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak on the children of Israel. Could that be fulfilled in the Old Testament? No, because he's talking about all of them becoming a king and a priest. Who could become a priest in the Old Testament? Only those of the tribe of Levi. So could it be fulfilled in the Old Testament? No. Furthermore, you had to be born into the priesthood. And only if you're the tribe of Levi could you be a priest. But now there's a new covenant, and there's a new priesthood. And there's a new way into the covenant, still birth, but not by physical birth. It's now by spiritual birth. You and I are spiritually born into the covenant, into becoming a priest before God. We see the work of Jesus Christ spoken of in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. From Jesus, from Jesus Christ, who's the faithful witness, and the firstborn, he's the firstborn of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood as he paid the price for us. And what's he made us? He's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. 
you are now a king and a priest unto God. This priesthood that we have is twofold, as we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It says, as lively stones, that's living stones, you and I become living stones in the house of God, with Jesus being the cornerstone, the first stone, so to speak, first one born again, our build up, a spiritual house, we're a spiritual house now, and what are we? We're a holy priesthood. So now on the day of Pentecost, everybody could become a priest, and we have the holy priesthood, and what are these ones? These ones now, the way in the holiness has been opened to all of us, and we can all enter in. And we can offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. But we also see down in verse 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. What's a royal priesthood? A royal means a ruling, reigning, kingly priesthood. You are kings, remember, and you are now to rule and reign. A holy nation. The holy nation. What's the holy nation? It's the church. You and I are the holy nation. A peculiar people that would show forth the praises of him. We've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light. God has called us out of darkness. He's called, brought us into the marvelous light. And now you and I are to walk in that. As we've come into the kingdom, we must understand that now as a holy priest, you can minister unto the Lord, come into the very presence of God. But as a king, now you are to rule and reign under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He's made you a king. Jesus came and brought forth the teaching of the, about the kingdom of God. John the Baptist declared it first. And then Jesus, of course, came and declared, Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This actually means being, has, brought, has come near, more literally, as Young's brings it out, has come nigh or has come near. The reign, the rule and the reign of God has come into manifestation. And Jesus went forth. And we see in verse 23 that he went about all Galilee, teaching the synagogues, and he was preaching, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God. And then he demonstrated by healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. That's what you and I are to do. The gospel is not just a gospel that gets us salvation so we're born again. It's more than that. This is a gospel that is going to bring forth God's rule and reign his power, his victory, his promises in our life to conquer all of our enemies. You must understand that when you and I have been born again, and what now is in the church age, in Colossians 1.13, it says, who has delivered us from the authority, the power there means authority, as Young brings out, the authority of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You're not... In, under the authority of darkness. That was Satan's authority. Satan is the one who had dominion over mankind because of the fall of man. He was a spiritual father over mankind until you and I get born again. Now, we've been delivered out of the authority of darkness, and we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You're now in a position in the kingdom because you have the same spirit that he has. And it's interesting in Ephesians chapter 2, over in verse 6, it says he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is speaking of our position in Christ but because of the fact that we have the same spirit that he has. He is in heavenly places in the position of authority. You got the same spirit he has and brought into the kingdom. You're in that same position spiritually as far as the rights to be able to rule and reign even though you're here on earth. You're now in the position of ruling and reigning and in, in being a king under the king of kings. And so we must understand now that God has given you authority. You're going to use authority. What do kings do? They rule and reign, and how do they do it? They've got to have authority. That's what God has given you. We see in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power. This first word power again is exousia, which means authority. Young's corrects the tr translation error. Young's literal translation that we keep here, the finest New Testament that I know. It says, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. You have authority over the power of the enemy. You can stop 
the works of the devil in your life. You can conquer every one of his works. We talk about this word authority. It's the word exousia. Usia means to be. Ex as a prefix means out of. It literally means to be out of or to go beyond yourself because the authority that you and I are given to is a delegated authority that's been given to us. We are actually going beyond ourselves as it's delegated to us through the name of Jesus and it's him operating through us. You don't have it in yourself. It's been delegated to you and you're simply a vessel that he operates through. So you and I now are, have a delegated authority and we are to operate in the kingdom. Well, that means you and I got to learn how this thing works. That's why it says in Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You need to understand the rule and the reign of God, how it operates, so that you can rule and reign under the lordship of Jesus and take your rightful place as a royal priest. And his righteousness, of course, you've got to learn his ways of righteousness so you walk in line with his word of righteousness so you will be righteous before the Lord. At the same time, how are we going to learn all this about the kingdom? What, what reveals it? The word of God is called the word of the kingdom. In Matthew 13, 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, the word of God is the word of the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God. A kingdom is, is a rule, means rule and reign. It's not a, a place of dwelling in the sense of I've come into the family of a, the kingdom. No, it's a position of ruling and reigning where you begin to rule and reign in that position in Christ. God wants us to get the word in us. The word of the kingdom reveals how his rule and reign operates. And what are you supposed to do? Well, you're going to enter into it. Just because, oh, I thought I've already come into it. Positionally, you have in Christ because you have his spirit, but not experientially until you enter into it. Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. It's interesting that this is talking about you entering into something because the word presseth is a word biazo, which means here, as you see, to use force or to apply, uh, to use violence, force or violence. And this is something that you're supposed to do continuously because this is a present tense verb. Otherwise, every man is to continually be using force and violence to enter into the rule and the reign of God. Force and violence? That's right. You're going to use spiritual force and violence against the enemy, who is Satan, to conquer him in your life and to conquer him in the heavenlies. As God has given the church dominion and authority, he says, I'm going to build my church. The gates of hell will not be able to prevail or stand against it because he has given us authority and we can destroy all of the works of the enemy. Now, God wants us to understand these things. In Matthew chapter 11, it tells us something. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. If you read that and you don't really check this out, you think the kingdom of heaven where God is is suffering violence and the violence are taking the kingdom of heaven by force? What's going on? It's not talking about where God is. How do you know? Because the word heaven is plural in the Greek. It's not talking about heaven where God is. It's talking about the reign of the heavens. Young's corrects the error in the King James Version. So you've got to look words up. You may not know Greek, but this is Scrivener's translation, which is the morphology behind the King James Version. And this is the particular word right here, this one that I put my cursor over, which means heaven, you see? And it happens to be a plural word. It should have been translated heavens. So the kingdom or the rule and the reign of the heavens is suffering violence. This is that same word, biazo, that we saw, using force and violence. Using force and violence. Well, you and I are to use that to enter into it? Well, you and I are going to come against the rule and the reign of what's going on in the heavens. And this is where the evil spirits are operating in the heavenlies. 
and the, the, the suffer is violent, and the violent, who are the violent? The violent are the strong, forceful ones that use violence. Who's that? The church, you and I. Well, you mean to tell me I'm supposed to be strong and force and operate in spiritual violence? You better believe you are. You're to conquer the enemy and destroy all of his works. The violent are taking it by force, which is a word which means to seize control, to seize control. You and I are to seize the rule and the reign of the heavenlies under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Should the devil be operating in the heavenlies? No. If the church was doing what it was supposed to be doing, you've got to understand, it wasn't just get born again, now you can go to heaven and then just live however you can. No. God's brought us into the priesthood. We can minister to God, we can receive all the promises, and we can rule and reign over all of our enemies now. We can conquer everything of the devil. Ephesians 6.12 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. People are not our problem. Who is the problem? The evil spirits. But against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in the high heavenly places. Therefore, you and I are dealing with evil spirits that are operating. You have dominion, and God has given you authority to destroy these works. This is what it's talking about also over in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, over in verse 19, it says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, we have a problem with the translations because the word heaven is plural in all three places. Again, Young's corrects the errors. Heavens, heavens, heavens. And we can again show you from Scriveners just quickly. That's the first one for heaven, plural. That's the second one for heaven, plural. And there's the third word for heaven, also plural. Why didn't they translate it correctly? Who knows? All I know is they were not faithful to translate it accurately. So it says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom or the rule and the reign of the heavens means you have the means of access to stop the works of the enemy in the realm of the spirit. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, where are you and I? On earth. Where is the, where is the binding going to go forth from? On earth, through you, because you have the delegated authority. Shall be bound, it says. Not a good translation. It shall be. It's a very strong statement here, because this is the word which is the main verb in the sentence. The indicative mood, you may not understand Greek and all this, but I'm just showing you this, that's the mood of fact or reality or of a statement of fact being made. So it says, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be, shall be, it shall be, because God's going to see it come to pass. Then when it says bound, this is not the main verb, because this is a participle in the Greek. A participle is like a verbal adjective. And so this is talking about something that is, the way you would translate this would be having been bound, having been bound, and this is because it's in a perfect tense. You may not understand all these things, but you're going to learn them if you stay, kind of keep coming. The perfect tense describes action that is past, completed in the past, with present results at the time of the speaking. So this is saying that whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be having been bound in the heavens. Now, when it talks about this, this means who's the one who does the binding? You and I do. Then who's the one who actually accomplishes it in the heavens? The angels do. The angels go forth and do that work. You're the one that speaks it forth, and then the angels will go into operation to accomplish that to tie up all these spirits. Because what's the word bind mean? It means to tie, tie up. I bind something up, I tie it up so it can't operate. I'm stopping its works, essentially. Whatsoever thou shalt loose, that's the opposite, untie. It means I can bind those spirits that are operating over this nation, which is why we pray this all the time, to stop its work. And I can loose, I can untie its hold where it's had places bound, or a person bound, or a city bound, or a nation bound. I can untie its hold. 
You and I have authority to do this. It shall be, having been untied in the heavens. Plural again. It means you and I are responsible to use our authority to stop the works of the enemy. See, we've got to understand what happened on the day of Pentecost. The church age came into being. Not only could we be born again and receive the Holy Spirit, not only have we come into a covenant relationship with God where we have all these promises, not only have we come to the place where now we can fellowship with Him and, and minister to Him, but you've come into a position of authority where you can conquer the enemy. In fact, you and I have the responsibility to conquer all of these spirits in the heavens, to cast them down, to throw them down, and destroy all of their works. It is our responsibility. Jeremiah 1.12, or excuse me, 1.10. He says, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Someone who's over the nations and the kingdoms, they're in a position of authority over them. Well, you and I are in a position of authority. What can we do? We can root them out. We can pull them down. We can destroy them. We can throw them down. We can destroy these works. As well as we can build and plant the things of God in the realm of the Spirit as we speak things into being. And the angels will go into operation to carry it out. You have authority and dominion. In fact, you and I are the, what God is going to use. This is why the church has to know what our authority is and our responsibility and what we're supposed to do. Jeremiah 51.20 says, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. He's going to use me, you and me. What are we going to do? He says, For with thee, that's you and me, will I, God's going to use us, and he's going to do the work through us, with you and me, thee, will I, that's God, Break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy the kingdoms. That's all the evil spirits. They have to be destroyed. That means you and I have to conquer them. That's why we must understand that the church that's come into existence is not some weak church. It is a mighty church. It is a church of the operating authority. It's a church that's to get full of power and destroy the works of the enemy. That's exactly what God expects. Not only are we going to destroy things in the heavens, but also God wants you to destroy all the works of the devil in your life. Mark 16, 17. The first sign following the believer after they get born again. These signs shall follow them that believe. <clears throat> in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. First two signs are the things that are rejected the most in the body of Christ. Casting out demons, Hardly anybody does it out there. Hardly any churches believe in this or carry it out. It's a mistake. It's the first thing that's listed here, so it certainly must be pretty important. They shall speak with new tongues also. That also must be done. Now, why do we need to speak with new tongues? Because do you and I know how to pray as we must? No, the Holy Spirit knows everything. And so if we can now pray with a spiritual prayer language, just what, your, what your tongues is, and, and pray what the Holy Spirit would pray through us, allow Him to pray through us, we can pray a perfect prayer. We can pray a prayer directed by God the Holy Spirit. That's what praying in tongues does, and it's so powerful. It releases the Holy Spirit intercession and prayer through you to pray for everything and anything that needs to be prayed for according to the will of God, because it's going to be directed by the Holy Spirit. So you and I need to cast out the demons and put our prayer language in operation. When talking about casting out the demons, what is that going to do? That's going to bring God's rule and reign into operation in your life. We see in Matthew 12, 28, what Jesus said. If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Notice the kingdom. You see, you've come into the kingdom positionally in Christ, but experientially you've got to do something to enter into it. It says, if I cast the demons out, then the kingdom is come unto you. The rule and the reign of God comes to you experientially when you cast the demons out. Why? Because you're getting rid of the spirits that are the root cause of the problem in your life. God wants us to cast all these spirits out. As we do that, we're going to get free. And he talks about here, how can one enter into a strong man's house? Who's the strong man's house? Satan's house. He's the strong man. What are we going to do? Spoil his goods. Well, that means we're going to eliminate what he's, what he's got going in our life. What are we going to do? First bind the strong man, then we're going to spoil his house. How do we spoil his house? Casting out the demons gets rid of all the spirits that are affecting us in our house, which you and I are the house of God, remember. And you must also understand,
that this Matthew 12, 28, where he talked about that, is really the fulfillment of what was spoken in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 15. Zephaniah 3, 15, it says, The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. What are judgments from? From sin. He hath cast out thine enemy. How do all of the effects of sin get eliminated in your life? By casting out the demons. Casting out the enemy. That's the, the Satan and his evil spirits. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Now that means the king, the rule and the reign of God. The kingdom of God has come into us. Thou shalt not see evil any more. That's not a promise when we get to heaven. That's a promise for now. That means as you cast out the spirits, you're going to destroy the works of the enemy, and you can come to the place of not seeing evil anymore. God wants us to get delivered so we are set free. And what does he want us to do? He wants us to rule and reign in life. You mean to tell me that I, now as a Christian, I can rule and reign over everything that the enemy would bring against me? Absolutely. Look what it says in Romans 5:17. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. That was Adam's sin. Death was reigning continually. Much more, those who receive, taking hold of the abundance of grace, you do that through the word of his grace that builds you up and gives you your inheritance, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. You and I are to reign in life. How? By one Jesus Christ. You and I can rule and reign over all of our enemies. Now, how are you going to be able to do that? You're going to use your faith. Your faith is the way you function and operate in the realm of the Spirit to see everything come into manifestation that God has given unto you. In fact, we must understand also that in order to possess all these things, you've got to know that you have an inheritance in Christ. Ephesians 1.11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. You've obtained an inheritance. We already saw that we're joint heirs with Christ. You're an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. You have an inheritance. And what are you, what are you an heir of? Well, if you're a joint heir with Jesus, you're an heir of all the things that he's an heir of. Hebrews 1, 2, what's it say? Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. You're an heir of all things, all the promises of God, everything that God has. He wants to bring forth every promise. You have an inheritance that belongs to you. Say, so, well, where is this inheritance? Well, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 tells you. It talks about in verse 3 how you and I have been begotten us again, which means born again, unto a lively hope, a confident expectancy, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What have we been born again to? To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away. Where is it? It's reserved in heaven for you. Now you can possess all the promises of God. All the promises of God belong unto you. Therefore, you and I have a, an inheritance, and we are to partake of that. How are you going to partake of all these inherited promises? What reveals them? The Word does. Acts 20, verse 32 says, now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, God's word. What's it going to do for you? It's going to build you up. It's also going to give you an inheritance. God's word is going to give you your inheritance as you hear and do the word because it reveals the inherited promises that belong to us as a believer in Jesus Christ. He wants us to partake of the inheritance that belongs to us. And how are you going to do it? You're going to use your faith. One of the things you've got to realize is you have the faith of Jesus Christ. When you've got a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ, you now have the faith of the Son of God. Don't sit there and think of your faith as just my little old faith. No. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. There's a brand new you on the inside of you, a new spirit. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this physical body, I live by what? By my own little faith? No, by the faith of the Son of God. How can I live by the faith of the Son of God? Well, you have to have the faith of the Son of God. We have the faith of Jesus Christ. 
What kind of a faith is this? Well, you've got to understand. When you got born again, you also got a spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we having the same spirit of faith. Whose faith? The faith of the Son of God. You got the spirit of faith of Jesus Christ. You have that same spirit of faith which will accomplish everything that God wants to bring forth in your life. According as is believed, as written, I believe, therefore by spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. What's that telling you? That tells you how you put your spirit of faith in operation. You believe God's word, and then you put it in operation by speaking with your mouth, working your faith to release your faith to go forth to accomplish the promise, bring the promises of God into being. Because you have a general spirit of faith, does that mean then that all the promises are automatically going to come to me? No, you've got to get specific faith. There's a difference between the general spirit of faith, which we got the same spirit of faith, then we need to get specific faith. How do we get specific faith on areas of the Word? It's through the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. As you are hearing God's Word, faith is coming to you. Faith to walk in love. Faith to be healed. Faith to be delivered. Faith so you have peace. Faith so you can be prosperous. Faith so you can, you know, function in ministry. Faith so you can operate in the kingdom. Because you hear the word on all of these different subjects. The word coming into you, the word gets written in your heart, producing faith. It gets written in your mind, producing hope. And this faith coming through hearing the word of God, now as you hear the word and hear the word, you get specific faith. Then what are you supposed to do? You're to put your faith in operation. Just because you heard the word and have specific faith doesn't mean it's going to automatically produce. Many people have assumed that just because I have faith that it's going to automatically work for me. Not so. Hebrews 4.2 says, we'll back up to verse 1, Let us therefore fear, the fear of God before us, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. What does that tell you? The promises of God which have been given to all of us, all the promises of God are yea and in him amen, left us of entering into his rest, although I'm not supposed to have any promise left out. And what does the promise do for me? It enables me to enter into his rest, the spiritual rest, as I possess the promises of God. And he says that any of you should seem to come short of it. We're not to become short in any promise. All the promises are to come to pass in our life. Well, how do I know about these promises? through the gospel, the word that's preached. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached, which is this word, and what does the word produce when you hear it? It produced faith, didn't it? Did it automatically profit you? No, it did not profit them. It did not, was not an advantage for them. Why? Because they didn't do something with the word that produced specific faith in their heart. They have to do something with it not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. That means you're going to mix your faith with the word that you heard. Or wait a minute, I thought the word that I heard produced specific faith. It did. So what is this talking about? I mix my faith with that which I heard, which produced specific faith. It's talking about your spirit of faith. You're going to mix using your spirit of faith with that which you heard that produced specific faith. By believing that word, and then speaking and or acting on it or working your faith or doing what it says, that is mixing your general spirit of faith with the word that produced specific faith. And when you put it into operation, then your faith will be working to bring forth the promises of God in your life. That's essential. Remember that if your faith is not working, are you going to see anything come to pass? No. James chapter 2, verse 20. Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? It's not doing anything. You mean to tell me I can have faith and it's dead? That's right. Without works, you've got to put your faith in operation. You've got to work your faith. Just because you believe doesn't mean your faith in operation. I hear people all the time say, well, I'm believing God for such and such. 
Well, that's wonderful that you're believing God for such and such. What are you doing of the Word of God? And what are you speaking into being? And what are you acting upon, putting your faith in operation to see what you believe God to bring to pass come into manifestation? Well, I don't know. I'm just believing God, you know. Believing God is faith. But if you don't work your faith, it's not going to produce for you. You're going to work your faith by acting on the Word, speaking the Word, doing what it says, putting your faith in operation. Faith without works is dead. It talks about how faith wrought with its works. By works was faith made perfect. What is your works? It's doing what the Word says, acting on the Word in some capacity, putting your faith in operation. In the area of dealing with the enemies in warfare, you can believe you have authority over the devil, and that's great. But you better put your faith in operation through spiritual fighting against the enemy, contending with the adversary, and attacking his works. Binding, loosing, those are works. Casting down, casting out, those are works. Speaking to a mountain, that's a work. Uh, resisting the enemy's attacks coming against you, that's a work of faith. You're working your faith against that enemy to see God give you victory. Fight, the good fight. Fight means to contend with adversaries. You are in a spiritual fight, and you and I are going to fight that good fight of faith against the enemy, and we're going to lay hold on eternal life. You can lay hold on all the promises of God, because now the promises of God belong unto you and to me. See, the Word is so important in your life, because not only does it produce faith and hope, but it also gives you instructions on the things that you must do so you see the results. This is why we've got to be a doer of the Word and continue in the Word, which is essential. Look what it says over in John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews that believed on Him, If you continue, that means to remain or abide in My Word, then are you My disciples indeed. A disciple is one who's been trained. He's now carrying this out continually. What happens then? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Did just hearing the Word make me free? No. I had to continue in the Word and become a real disciple. It's what I'm, I'm going to continue to do it. Then I'm going to know the truth, and then the truth is going to make me free. It's going to bring me to the place of liberty and victory in my life. Your faith will bring forth victory for you in your life. That's why you've got to learn to put your faith in operation. Of course, you've got to hear the Word, get specific faith, but then work your faith. Look what it says in 1 John 5, 4. Whatsoever is born of God, that's you and me, overcomes or conquers and carries off the victory, is what this word means literally in the Greek. The world, we have to conquer the enemy. He's in the world. Satan's the god of this world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, what? Even our faith, because your faith is of the Spirit. When you function in faith, you are putting your spiritual power, in spiritual faith in operation, releasing the power of God in the Word to bring forth the promises of God into your life. And that's why, of course, you and I need to be hearers and doers of the Word. James 1.22 See, we've got to understand, when you, the church came into being, God has brought us into the position so we can be born again, so we can receive the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. He's going to teach us, reveal the truth of the Word of God to us. Now, we've come into covenant relationship, all these promises that belong to us. You now, I have, we have covenant relationship. We can know what God will do, and we can know what we will do because we have a covenant. God says He'll do this, but I've got to do my part. We also come into the priesthood, we now are holy priests. We can come into the presence of God, minister to Him, receive the promises. Also, we are now a royal priesthood. We can rule and reign over all of our enemies. We are now in the positions of authority. We're brought into the kingdom. Now we are to get the, understand the rule and the reign of God and the inherited promises that belong to us that we're going to possess, and we're going to use our faith to go in and possess them. And you are going to become a doer of the Word because doing the Word is the working of your faith. Hearing the Word produces the faith. If you don't do what you hear, your faith is not put in operation. You're not working it, and therefore, results will not come to pass. You can believe forever, but you're going to work your faith to bring what you believe into manifestation. B, 
It actually means to become. God is saying every one of us are to become doers of the word. And by the way, this isn't a suggestion. This is a command, imperative mood. God has commanded you and me to become doers of the word. And notice it's a present tense. The present tense in the Greek means ongoing, continuous action. You and I are going to continually become doers of the word. We don't just do it once and then quit. We do it continuously until we see the results of the promises come into pass. And then we keep doing it in other areas. Not hearers only, otherwise you deceive your own self. Many people deceive themselves. They've heard the word and they're waiting for God to do something instead of working their faith or using their authority, conquering the enemy, binding, loosing, casting down, throwing down, resisting, speaking the mountain, whatever it might be, putting their faith in operation. They're just, they're just waiting for God to do something. You'll be waiting forever. No. Same thing in prayer. We're gonna, when we pray, we pray to take hold of the promises of God to sp and speak them into being, to release them to come to pass in our life. Prayer is not waiting to see if God's going to do something. In the New Testament, we now can pray and take hold, lambano, the promises of God and release them to come into manifestation when we work our faith. We pray a prayer of faith is to take hold of it to see it come to pass. We're not going to deceive ourselves. We're not going to be like a hearer, guys that hear the word, not a doer is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, beholds himself, goes his way, straightway forgets what manner of man he was. No. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, what's the word of God? It's the perfect law of liberty. It'll bring great liberty in your life. And continues there, and he's abiding in it. This is what he's doing. He's living in it, remaining in it, continuing in it. He just didn't look into it and then go do what he wants. No, he's applying his life. He's, putting it into, he's making it his lifestyle. It's the way he's living. Not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. That tells you something. When I'm a doer of the word, I'm a doer of the work. Because I've got to do the work. What work? that work of working my faith and working out my own salvation and doing the work of doing the word in order to see God accomplish his promises. This man is going to be blessed in his doing, more literally it means. It's the word for doing. So the doer of the work is blessed in his doing because you and I are going to do the word of God. What happened on the day of Pentecost? It was just the beginning of what God wants to do in the church. We get born again. We receive the Holy Spirit. We've come into covenant relationship with him. We have an inheritance now in Christ. Now we are in the position of the, in the priesthood. We can come into the very presence of God and fellowship with him. We now also are a king. We're delivered from the authority of darkness. We can use our authority and triumph and conquer the enemies in our life. And we're going to use our authority and we're going to enter in with force and violence to, to stop the works of the enemy, not only in the heavenlies, but also in our own lives. And we're going to come and possess the inherited promises that belong to us with our faith. We're going to work our faith, and we're going to see the promises of God come into manifestation. The church age, it began. There were four days, which is 4,000 years, until the time of Jesus Christ. Then there's two days, which are the 2,000 years of the church age. It began in 30 A.D. It's not over yet till 2030 A.D. That's going to be the time of the end of the church age. There's a lot of time for things to happen. You're going to see things go downhill in the world. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse. At the same time, the church is going to arise. The church, the, the early church, took hold of all these things, and the glory of God was manifested mightily. And they did great, mighty works, and they saw God meeting their needs and tremendous blessings coming upon them. God's going to do the same thing in the end time church, except the glory of God is going to be greater. It's going to be greater than the former house, because you and I are going to come to the place of partaking of everything that the church is to be. We are the holy nation. We are the ones who are walked and his ways and possess everything that he has for us and rule and reign over our enemies and pray and see God manifest himself greatly in, in, the, in the church. He wants to set you free from every bondage. He wants you to get every promise. He wants you to enter into everything that he has for you. He's not holding anything back. We've just got to learn his ways and work our faith, use our authority, 
learn how to speak the word, speak things into being, learn how to pray accurately and effectively, and we'll see everything come to pass in our life. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you for the work of Jesus Christ in bringing forth the church. I thank you that Pentecost was the beginning of the church age. Jesus having accomplished the redemption, seated at the right hand of the Father, sent the Holy Spirit in so I could be born again, receive the Holy Spirit. Now I come into the priesthood. I am a holy priest. I can minister unto the Lord and I can come into the presence of God and receive all the promises of God. And I'm now a royal priest. I've been delivered out of the authority of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus. I'm in the position of authority. I can conquer the enemies in my life. I will seek the kingdom and I will begin to use force and violence to enter into the rule and the reign of God. I am a vessel. Delegated authority has been given unto me. I have the responsibility to rule and reign over all enemies. I will use that authority. I will conquer the enemy and carry off the victory. I have an inheritance. I'm an heir of all things. I'm a joint heir with Christ. Every promise is mine. I have the faith of Jesus. I'm going to put my faith in operation, working my faith, acting on the word that produced specific faith. As I work my faith, I will conquer the enemy. I will possess the promises. And as I'm a consistent hearer and doer the word, I will see everything God purposes to come to pass in my life. I'm going to possess the promises and enter into his rest and triumph over all enemies. I thank you, Lord, for the great work that Jesus has done. Now I'm in the church. I'm in a position of victory. I'm more than a conqueror, able to overcome, able to receive every promise, be a partaker of the inheritance. It belongs to me. I'm going to take it all. I'm going to do everything that God tells me to do. I will become a consistent doer of the Word of God, not a hearer only. And because I'm a doer of the work, I will be blessed in my doing because I'm looking into the perfect law of liberty, the Word of God and all the promises, and I'm continuing therein doing it consistently and I will enter in to everything that God has for me. Thank you, Lord, for all you've accomplished. Thank you for the church age. Thank you for what I am in Christ. I will walk in your ways and I will see every promise come to pass in my life and every enemy will be destroyed and put underfoot. Thank you for giving me victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. He will absolutely do that. One scripture we might just leave you with. Revelation 21, 7. He that overcomes or conquers and carries off the victory shall inherit all things. You conquer to inherit all things. You have an inheritance, but you've got to conquer to see it manifest. And I will be as God, and he shall be my son. God expects you and me to conquer. So we're going to rise up, and we're going to take our rightful place, and we're going to conquer all of our enemies. The church age, the church hasn't known this out there. They've just been living according to the flesh, living in the world, dominated by the enemy, not even knowing they had to cast out the demons, not knowing they had authority and dominion to stop all the works in the heavens. No, it's a new day. God's bringing forth the revelation of the truth. 
And you and I are entering into it, and we will possess everything that God has for us. Father, we thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. Thank you that each one will be a hearer and a doer of the word. And thank you, Father, for bringing forth the manifestation of the promises and the victory in our life. We will conquer and inherit all things. And you'll be our God and we will be your son, your daughter, your child. Thank you for giving us victory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Tonight we're going to talk more. We've got more things to talk about, about what's happened in the church age from the time of Pentecost. And we'll be talking about that in the 6.30 service tonight. If you need prayer, I want to invite you to come forward. God bless. Have a great afternoon. Be a doer of the word. Put it in operation. Watch God work mightily. If you need prayer for healing, prayer for deliverance, prayer for anything, please come forward. Have a great afternoon. You're dismissed. God bless.